Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on pivot tables in Microsoft Excel. We've got quite a few people in the room, so I think we'll get cracking. Um, my name's Adam. I'm Operations Director here at SimonSaysIt.com and StreamSkill.com, and you are in for a treat today. We have, in my humble opinion, one of the best Microsoft trainers around, Deborah Ashby. And she'll be teaching us how to analyze data using pivot tables in Microsoft Excel. But before we dive into the session, just a couple of quick bits of housekeeping. Um, let us know where you are from is the first one. Uh, so um, there's a comments box on the right hand side. Just drop it into there. Um, tell us where you're from and um, your name as well would be great. Brilliant, getting some good uh, getting some good intros already. Thank you everyone who's dropping their name into there. People from all over the world, which is brilliant. Cool, make sure you can see our screen is the second one. We'll check as we go along, but in testing, we did experience a couple of slight lags, um, but we'll try and account for that as we take you through the content. Um, and we will be answering questions, and we will be taking questions again, so drop those into the comments box and we'll try and pick those up as we um, as we go along but we're probably going to answer most of those at, at the end of the session so we don't disturb Debs' uh, Debs's flow um, and there will be and this is important there will be a recording email to you afterwards that happens automatically um, in the next 24 to 48 hours so if there's anything you miss or you want to go over anything again that will be emailed to you So just very quickly, some bits of information about Simon Says It. Um, we're formed in 2008 and we're currently used in over 180 countries. We've trained 400,000 people to date. Um, and if you're not aware, we have a really good YouTube channel with 184,000 subscribers and over a thousand videos now. So if you're not uh, subscribed to us or following us on YouTube, make sure you do. There's tons of really great content on there. We run two brands, simonsaysit.com and streamskill.com, where you can access all of our training courses for a low monthly fee. And finally, we love Microsoft Excel. We have 13 courses on it and started training um, it in 2007. Debs, who's the trainer on this webinar, is currently recording the Advanced Excel 2019 course for us. That's due out at the end of Feb early March. So watch out for that. We'll probably send that out on email when that's uh, when that's released. OK, so I think I have talked enough. Um, thank you, everybody who's dropped their name and uh, where they're from into the into the uh, into the comments. Great to see so many people from all over the world. Um, but with um, well, you're here to learn about pivot tables. So without further ado, here is Excel expert Deborah Ashby. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Adam. I'll just pull up my slides so everyone can see. Hopefully everybody could see those. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Simon Says IT webinar on pivot tables in Excel. My personal favorite subject is everybody who knows me knows I love a pivot table. Um, before we start, Adam did briefly introduce me, but just to give you a little bit more of a, a fuller idea of who I am, I'll just go through this slide for a couple of minutes. So my name is Deborah Ashby and I'm an IT trainer and subject matter expert for Microsoft products. And I've been working in the IT industry for about 24 years. It's a bit scary when I say that out loud, um, both in the UK and in Australia. And the last 11 of those years has been specifically in IT training. So I tend to be involved in a whole host of different activities, which is why I enjoy my job so much. I write training courses, produce them. Um, I run classroom training and also webinars such as this one. Um, I am TAP certified and also Microsoft certified. So hopefully that qualifies me to be hosting this session for you today. And if you haven't been able to tell from the accent, I am uh, based in London in the UK. And I know we have so many participants on the call today from North America and other countries around the world. I was really surprised when I saw your, I saw some 
somebody from Belize in there. That's absolutely incredible. I went to Belize about 20 years ago and it was beautiful. <laughs> Um, so I try not to use any slang, but if something does creep through and you don't understand, then please feel free just to uh, ask in the chat window. I've got the, the lovely Adam on hand to answer any questions about the logistics of this webinar. And he's also pretty good at Excel as well. So he might be able to help you if you have any burning Excel questions. But as we mentioned, I am going to leave some time at the end. So if you have any questions for me specifically or anything that we've covered, covered in the webinar, then then please just jot them down and ask them at the end and I'll try and answer as many as I can. Now, because this is the first webinar, I'm not going to assume that everybody is used to this style of training. So just to let you know what usually happens in these, we usually keep all of your microphones on mute throughout the whole session. And that's not because I don't want to talk to you. I would love to talk to all of you. It's really just because we have a lot of people on the call today. And if we have the open mics, then it gets very hard to manage. So just bear that in mind. If you say something, I can't actually hear you. So please just do utilize that chat window. So without further ado, let's jump into the agenda for today. So what are we going to cover? Well, I'm going to start right at the beginning. I never like to assume that you know anything about the subject that I'm training. So we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to work our way up. So let's start with that question. What are pivot tables and why are they useful? I'm going to explain that to you first of all. We'll then go in and take a look at the different ways that you can create a pivot table from scratch. And there are a few different ways that you can do it. And it's really entirely up to you which one of them you use. But I will show you uh, three different ways of creating a pivot table. And we'll then go into pivoting and manipulating the pivot table using all of the pivot table tools that we have available. We will look at how you can filter and sort and slice data as well. If you've never used slices, they're extremely fun. I love slices, so we're going to look at those too. And I'm going to show you how you can update your pivot table as well. And then finally, at the end, I will show you how you can create a really nice visual representation of your data by creating a pivot chart from your pivot table. And that's just a basic overview of what we're going to go through. I'm going to try and throw in lots of little shortcuts and things as well as we go through. So how does that sound, everyone? Just type into the chat if that sounds good, just so I know you're all still there and awake. Yes, wonderful. All right. OK, so let's talk about this first question. What are pivot tables and why are they useful? Well, Pivot tables really are one of the great strengths of Excel, and they've been a part of Excel for many years, and they continue to be improved in every new version of Excel that's released. And what a pivot table allows you to do at a high level is analyze data really effectively. So if you have a large data set in Excel and you put it into a pivot table, you instantly gain much more flexibility in terms of how you can look at that data versus just having it in a static table. You can essentially move the fields or column headings around and view your data in lots of different ways really quickly and easily. Now, that might not make much sense to you at this stage, but it will become clearer as we go through some live examples. And we are, are going to walk through a live example from beginning to end in just a moment. However, before we do that, I just want to take you through some rules and some guidelines with regards to the type of data that is suitable for a pivot table, because not all data is suitable for a pivot table. The best kind of data or data that suits a pivot table is transactional data. And what we mean by that, transactional data isn't necessarily to do with financial transactions, but it's any kind of data where each record corresponds to a measurement of something. So for example, it could be a record of a sale in a store, or maybe it might be something like a measurement for the amount of rain on a particular day. Your data must be organized, so it must be one record per row. And pivot tables really don't like blank rows. So if you have some data, you need to make sure you check it and make sure the data is consistent and remove any blank rows. If you've got blank rows in there, your pivot table is going to really struggle. And I'm going to show you some techniques as to how you can do that quite quickly. 
Also blank cells, you can't have any blank cells. So if there is a blank cell, what I normally do is just put a zero in there so it's not left blank. Oops, there we go, <laughs> no empty cells. And then finally, and this is the most important thing, your information or your data must have column headers. Pivot tables utilize column headings heavily. So it's really important to make sure that your data has those column headings at the top before you start. All right, so that's just some guidelines. Now, having said all of that, the best way you're going to learn this is if we just jump head first into our example. So I'm going to come out of PowerPoint and switch across to Excel. OK, let me just zoom out slightly. Now, this is the data that I'm going to use. And what this data is, and I know it looks a little bit odd at the moment. So this data is essentially data on sales within a cafe in a convenience store. And we're keeping four pieces of information on each sale. So we're keeping the date of the sale, the branch it was sold at, the value of that sale, and then the department that that sale belongs to. So this is the data I'm going to use. And I have a lot of rows. If I press control down arrow, that will jump me to the last row in my data. You can see I have just over 34,000 rows. So quite a lot of data in there. Now, this is what we were talking about before. Before you start to do your pivot table, you need to look at the data that you want to use in your pivot table. And you need to make sure that it's consistent and in a good format in order to create your pivot table. So looking at my data here, I can see I've got a few issues going on here. And this might be the case because you're not always using data that you've created yourself in a pivot table. You might be importing it from maybe a database or maybe it's come from somebody else. And there might be various different errors, things like blank rows, blank cells. And you really need to tidy up your data prior to putting it into a pivot table. And we run a whole webinar on cleaning data in Excel. And if that's something that you're interested in, uh, let us know at the end, because we are sort of thinking maybe of doing more of these webinars. So cleaning data is another webinar that I run occasionally, where we go through all the techniques of taking data that's kind of messy, tidying it all up using various different functions and different techniques ready to put into a pivot table. So that might be something that you might be interested in. Now, I'm going to do a few of those little things now because I can see here that my data doesn't look very consistent at the moment. So what things have I got to deal with in here? Well, I can see that I have some blank rows. And if you remember, I said at the beginning, pivot tables don't like blank rows. So I'm going to want to remove those. I've got some weird things going on in column D. So I can see that my, my data isn't really consistent in here. I've got some uh, weird little erroneous spaces. And I've also got some inconsistencies in the case. So I want to fix all of that. And my values look a bit odd as well. So these are supposed to be uh, currency values. And yeah, they don't look quite correct. So I want to fix that. And also my date looks a little bit weird as well. So we have a few things which I'm going to tidy up first before we create the pivot table. I can't stress how important this step is. <laughs> Getting your data correct first before you do your pivot table. Now, let's deal with these blank rows, first of all. Now, blank rows are fairly easy to deal with. There is uh, something in Excel which you can use in order to get rid of them all in one go, because it would be pretty tedious if you had to go through all your data, highlighting all the blank rows, and then deleting them from up here. So we can get Excel to find those blank rows for us. Now, because my data set is quite long, in, in a real world environment, and I'm aware that this is quite uh, contrived data that I've just put in here, in a real world environment, you could highlight all of your uh, table. So sorry, if I scroll back up to the top, you could highlight your columns. And then you could go to Find and Select, go to Special, and you could select blanks here. And then Excel will run through, and it will find all of your blank rows. Now. When you've got a lot of data like I have, it takes about 20 seconds for it to find all of those uh, rows. So what I'm going to do, just as a bit of a cheat way so we don't have to wait 20 seconds, is I've only put those blank rows in the top, <laughs> top part of the table. So I'm just going to highlight the top part. This will just make it all a little bit quicker. And I'm going to go to Find and Select. 
go to special and I'm going to select blanks and click OK. And it should be pretty quick. And there you go. You can see Excel has highlighted all of those blank rows very quickly. I can now go up to the home ribbon across to my cells group and in the delete drop down, I can say delete sheet rows. And there we go. Very quickly, I've got rid of all those rows. And you can probably tell how important that's going to be. If you've got thousands and thousands of rows of data, being able to do that quickly uh, makes it a really efficient process. All right, so we've got rid of them. What else do we need to deal with? Let's deal with the easy things first of all, the date. Now, these dates all look a little bit weird in here, and I can see that that is because I don't have the correct formatting applied to column A. So again, if I go up to my home ribbon, and in the center here where we have the number group, I can see I've got general formatting applied in column A. What I really want is to have the date format in there. So I'm going to highlight my column, click the drop down, and I'm going to select short date. And that makes my dates look like dates again. I'm going to do the same. Now, column B looks OK. I can see I've got my different um, cities and states in there. And in column C, again, I've got the wrong formatting applied. So I'm just going to go up and I'm going to select currency. And there we go. That looks a little bit better. So we've done a few things there to make our data look a little bit more consistent. But we still have this troublesome column D where we have those inconsistencies with the case and those weird spaces. So I'm going to show you a couple of really, really useful text functions. And these are useful not just when you're cleaning data, but just when you're doing lots of different things in Excel. I'm going to show you a couple of them now, which will help us fix these problems. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to widen column E. And the first text function I'm going to show you is a function called proper. So in cell E2, I'm going to type in equals proper. I'm going to open my parentheses. Now, you can see underneath here, and I don't know how familiar you are with using functions, uh, proper is one of the text functions. And it's telling me underneath what arguments this function requires. So it's telling me it needs the text. Now, what proper does is it converts whatever I select to what we call proper case. So that means the first letter of each word will be capitalized. OK, which is what I want in this scenario. So I'm going to select D2 and I'm going to close my parentheses and press enter. And you can see now what it's done. It's made it into proper case, which is perfect. Incidentally, a little tip, if you wanted everything in uppercase, you could use the command upper. And that will put it in uppercase. And similarly, I'm sure you can see what's coming here if you do lower it will put everything into lowercase. So those are three text functions that are really useful. So I'm going to put mine back to whoops, proper, like so. And I'm going to copy that down, so fill down. And the way that I like to do this, and again, as with most things with Microsoft, there are many different ways that you can do the same thing. The way that I find easiest is just to hover over the bottom right-hand corner until I get that little black cross. And then when I double click, it fills it down for me. And I can see everything now is in proper case. Now, we still have a little issue here. So you can see here, whilst it's converted the case, it hasn't removed these weird spaces that we have at the front of these two words. Now, how can I get rid of what we call erroneous spaces? And that might be leading spaces, training spaces, so on and so forth. Well, we can use another text function called trim. Now, I don't want to do it in another column, so I can combine it with the proper function up here. And what I can do is I can say equals trim. And I can have it like that. And remember, when you're doing functions, if you're combining functions like we are here, whenever you have an open parentheses, you need to make sure you close off as many as you open. So I'm going to make sure I put that second parentheses at the end. And when I hit enter and copy it down, there we go. It's fixed those leading spaces that we had in there. So my data now looks really nice, really consistent. But obviously, I have 
essentially a duplicate. So I have what I want to use, column E, but I also have this column D. And a mistake that people often make is after they've kind of run some of these commands to tidy up their data is they think, ah, OK, I'll go in and I will delete column D. But this happens if you delete column D. You're going to get an error. And the reason why you get an error is because you've got formulas in there which are referring to the information that we've just deleted. OK, so we can't do that. I'm going to undo Control Z or use the undo icon. And instead, what I'm going to do is a little trick that I like to use. And I'm just going to copy column E just by highlighting. And you can either click copy on the home ribbon or press the, control, uh, the shortcut control C. And I'm going to paste it over column D, but I'm not just going to do a regular paste. So I'm not going to do a control V. I'm going to go up to my paste special button and I'm going to click the lower half. And I'm going to choose paste values. And what that will do is it will paste just what you can see and it won't paste the underlying formulas. So if I paste, that's what we get. And I can now go in and I could delete either of those columns. And I'm just going to put uh, department back at the top. All right, so now when I click on these cells, if you look in the formula bar, I don't have the formulas underneath. I've thrown those away when I've pasted just the values. So those are a couple of little tricks for cleaning up your data. Now, before we create the pivot table, because my data is looking pretty decent now, there is one more thing I like to do, and I would always advise you to do this, and that is to put your uh, data into a table prior to creating your pivot table. Now, you might think, you might be looking at your data thinking, well, hang on a second. Uh, this looks like it's in a table. A lot of people think that because Excel has a kind of like a table structure. It has a grid structure. You could be fooled into thinking that your data is already in a table, but it's actually not. There is a command on the home ribbon, and it's this one here, format as table. And once you apply one of those, and you can pick any one you like, it doesn't matter, it will then put your data into a table. And that's useful for a number of reasons, which will become clear as we go through the webinar today. So I'm going to click just somewhere in my data, go to format as table, and I'm going to select, uh, let's do this one. And what Excel will do is it will say, where is the data for your table? And it basically picks up all of the data surrounding where you were clicked. So I can see the little marching ants around the outside of data. That looks correct. And I've got a tick in the box that says my table has headers, which it does. And I'm going to click OK. And that's now put my data into a table. And as I said, this is just formatting that's automatically applied. And I can tell that my data is in a table now because I get the table tools contextual ribbon at the top. If you cast your eyes to the top of the screen, when I'm clicked in the table, I have this new ribbon which says table tools with a sub ribbon called design. And on this sub ribbon, I have all of the commands that I can use relating to my table that I've just created. You'll see that that disappears if I click outside of the table. That's why it's called a contextual ribbon. It only appears when you need it. So when I'm clicked within that table. One other thing I like to do is I like to name my tables. Now, I'm going to highlight all of my table. And a quick little way of doing that is there's a couple of ways. You could do Control A. That will highlight your table if you're clicked within it. But another little way you can do it is if you do Control and uh, Asterix will also highlight all of your table. And up in the top left hand corner, we have where it says table name. So I'm going to call my table uh, sales underscore data. Really important when you're naming tables, you can't have any spaces in that table name, which is why I tend to separate words with an underscore. Or you could have it all together, sales data, all one word. 
Another really important point, which I always forget, so I'm sure a lot of other people forget as well, is that once you've typed in that table name, you must remember to press the enter key in order to get that to set. Otherwise, it doesn't set and your table isn't named. Try and get into the habit of naming everything in Excel. It does help you in the long run as you go through. It helps you to be able to identify uh, different tables, different charts, different pivot tables, lots of different things, even different ranges of data as well. And you'll see as we go through, I'm going to be naming lots of different things. All right, so now finally we are ready to create our pivot table. The thing we've come here to see, how do we create a pivot table? Well, there's a few different ways that you can create a pivot table. Again, one of the ways is if I highlight all of my tables, so I'm just going to do uh, control shift asterisk again. I don't know if you can see, it's quite small, right at the bottom, just down by sort of the end of cell uh, or the beginning of cell E16, there's a little pop-up button here. And as I hover over, it says quick analysis. So if I click it and click on the little tables tab in here, I have two options for pivot tables. And when I hover over them, I get a little preview of what my pivot table is going to look like if I was to select that option. And what Excel does, it basically looks at the data that you've highlighted and it works out what's going to be the best pivot table to suggest to you. So it's given me two suggestions. So it's telling me here, if I was to click on this one, it's going to organize my pivot table by branch. So Atlanta, Detroit, Houston, Phoenix with all of the values, so the total of all sales for those branches. So that might be what I'm looking for. And what does the other one show me? Well, if I was to select this one, it's going to display my pivot table in a slightly different way. So this time it's going to be broken down by department and I can see the total sales for those departments. So if I wanted one of those, I could select either of those. That's the first way that you could create your pivot table. Let's look at another way. Let's click back inside our data and this time go up to the insert ribbon. Now another way, and this was introduced, I can't remember if it was introduced in 2013 or 2016, it might have been 2016, this recommended pivot tables button. And again, this is quite similar to the quick analysis button in a way because when I click on it, Excel looks at my data and again, it suggests me the same two pivot tables. So it's saying these are going to be the best pivot tables that are suited to the data that you have highlighted. And the thing I like about recommended pivot tables is if you're fairly new to creating pivot tables, it kind of takes all the hard work out of it for you. If you just select one of these, it creates your pivot table for you and you don't really have to do anything too much. Now, I'm not going to do it that way because I want you to see the process of manually creating a pivot table. It's super easy, so I'm going to walk you through it now, but you could do recommended pivot tables if you wanted to. And let's cancel out of there. All right, so let's go through the manual way of creating a pivot table. I'm going to click in my data once again and on the same ribbon. So we're going to stay on the insert ribbon and we're going to go to the pivot table option which is the first option on the ribbon. And there we go. So we get our little create pivot table dialog box pop up. And the first thing we have, it says, choose the data that you want to analyze. And then we've got the first option, select a table or range already selected. And you can see that it's picked up my table range sales data. Remember, that's the name I give that table. If I hadn't have named my table, it would say something quite generic in there, like table one, which further down the line is quite difficult to identify exactly what that table contains, which is why I like to name my tables. So yes, that's the data I want to use, all of the data within my table. The other options I have in here are use an external data source. So if you wanted to maybe use uh, some data that you have in an external Excel spreadsheet, or maybe you want to link to a database and pull that data into using your pivot table, you could select that option there, use an external data source. And there is a third option, and that is use this workbook's data model. And 
What that option means is you could, um, essentially a data model allows you to combine lots of different data sources and create one pivot table from multiple sources. So that is an option you could use if that's what you wanted to do. We're keeping it fairly basic today. So we're just gonna use the data that we have in our table. In the lower half of this pane, we can then choose where we want the pivot table report to be placed. And again, by default, it's telling us it's going to put our pivot table on a brand new worksheet. I normally go for this option because I like to separate everything out when I'm doing this. So I like to have my source data on one worksheet and I like to have my pivot table on another worksheet entirely. You could, if you wanted to, choose an existing worksheet and put the pivot table there. But for the time being, I'm just going to leave new worksheet selected and I'm going to click on OK. And what you'll see almost immediately, oops, and if I just move that over to here, what you'll see almost immediately is we have a new sheet created. And before I forget, because again, I always forget this step, I'm going to rename this sheet so I know exactly what it is. So I'm going to rename it pivot table, like so. Now, what you see now is a blank pivot table. So this is the pivot table builder or the pivot table report, which currently has nothing in it. And what we have over on the right hand side are our pivot table fields area. And this little pane is a, a pane which you can pop out and you can float around. So at the moment I have it anchored to the uh, right hand side of my screen. But if you wanted to, you could just hover over the top. And when you get that crosshair, you can drag and you can float that little pane out and place it wherever you like on your screen. I always have it anchored over here, but it's entirely up to you. Now, what does this pane show us? Well, let's look. In the top part, it says uh, date, branch, value, and department. And these are essentially the column headings from our data source, date, branch, value, department. So it's pulled in those headings. That is why it's very important to have column headings on your data. If you remember, I said that at the start. And what we have in the bottom half are what we call our drop zones, which sounds very exciting. And we have four drop zones, filters, columns, rows, and values. And what we can essentially do is that we can populate these drop zones with different column headings or different fields. And whichever drop zone we put them in, our data is going to display in a different way and we can move them around and really kind of try and extract out of the data exactly what we want to see. And that is one point I want to make. It's really important to really think about what exactly are you trying to extract from this data before you get going with your pivot table? You know, do you want to see uh, which department is performing best? Or do you want to see if sales are increasing or decreasing? You know, what is it you want to see? And that will help you when you're constructing your pivot table. So let's start adding some fields into our drop zones. Now, the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to add date. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click next to date. Now, date has been added into the rows drop, uh, ro <laughs> rows drop zone, and you'll see something slightly odd has happened there as well. I've clicked date and it's put it down here, but it's also put in months. Now, what it's done is it's noticed that in our data over here, our date is broken down into individual days. OK, so when we've dropped the date down, it's allowed us to give a summary by month or just by date. And if you have a look in the rows now, you can see I have the dates and this is the time period that our data covers, January to July. And I also have little plus buttons next to each of these. And if I click the plus, you can see it shows me all of the days that are from my data. Now, I generally, and this might not be the case for you, I generally don't want to see my data split down by day. I'm more interested in an overview of the, the month entirely. So I could turn off the, the little date uh, section if I wanted to, which we will do in a moment. But let's add some more data in. The next thing I'm going to add is we're going to get some values in here. So I'm going to click on values 
And that automatically populates the values drop zone. And again, if we look at how that's building up our pivot table, you can see now we have a sum of all the values. So what it's showing us at the moment is our total. So all of our sales for January, February, March, April, May, so on and so forth. And again, I could expand and it shows me the breakdown per day. So the amount of sales per day, and that's for all departments and all branches because we haven't added those to our pivot table as yet. And I'm gonna collapse those back up. Now let's add branch and department. And again, if I click branch, it's going to add it down into rows. Now you may think, well, why is it keep adding stuff into rows? It's because these are text fields. So all text fields, when you click on them, will be added into rows automatically. Now you can move these around, which I will do in a moment, but you can see here, branch has gone down into rows. So if I expand January, you'll now see we have a slightly different way of viewing our data. So now we have it broken down by month and then by day and then by branch underneath, okay, for each day. That's not particularly the nicest way to display this kind of data, but just to show you what that sort of initial default data is going to look like. What's going to happen and watch the data as I do this, if I grab the branch field and drag it above months and drop it, my data changes again. So now we have the branch showing at the top, then the month, then the date. And you can see that replicated down here in the rows area. And you can move these around until your heart is content and come up with all different ways of viewing and displaying your data. So let's just minimize these again. Now, I don't particularly like that layout, so I'm going to move my fields around slightly and just get it into a layout that I like. So I'm going to move branch across to columns and let's see what that looks like. That's quite nice. So now I can see my months and I can see my branches and I can see the total sales for all of those branches. So that's not bad. What about this filters drop zone? We haven't really talked about that as yet. Well, we have one more field that we haven't used. So I'm going to drag department and drop it into filters. And you can see now what I get at the top above my pivot table is the department drop down. If I click it, it shows me all of my departments. And this works very similar to a regular filter that you might have used previously. So if I just wanted to see all of the sales information for, let's think, let's do coffee, and I'm gonna select multiple items, coffee and tea, and click OK, I can filter for just those two items. So now I'm seeing that for all of the branches, we just have data for February and April, and those are the total sales for coffee and T. Okay, so that filter is quite useful. I can just click and I can select all to bring back all of my data at the top there like so. So hopefully you can see how you can really move these around and I could, you know, drag and drop until my heart's content. I could put department in columns as well, which again makes it look a little bit strange. I could drag it down to rows and uh, again the department would then appear underneath here. Again, not the nicest way to display, so I'm going to keep it up in filters and have my data like that because I think that looks quite nice. Now, let's just go back to that date area. So, as I said, we've got these little plus and minuses where we've got it broken down by day. Now, I'm not particularly interested in that, so I'm going to turn off the day. So, I just want to see it summarized by month. Now, what I can do is I can just grab the date field down here and I can just drag it out to get rid of it. And you'll see immediately those plus buttons disappear. Now, if you're wondering why when you drag date down, why did it add date and months? Well, that's a setting within your pivot table settings. And I'll show you how you can control that. I'm going to click in my pivot table. And much like when we clicked in our table and got table tools, when we click in our pivot table, if you cast your eyes up to the top of the screen, we have a ribbon called pivot table tools. And it has two sub ribbons, analyze and design. 
And this is where you can control every aspect of your pivot table. So I'm currently clicked on design. And the kinds of things I can do in here is I could change the color if I wanted to. Let's make it, let's make it purple. I could do some more formatting. I could add some banded rows if I wanted to. I could do banded columns. And I also have the option of controlling some the way the totals are displayed. And again, by default, I have grand totals displayed down here. I could choose to turn those off if I wanted to. So off for rows and columns to get rid of those grand totals. I actually like those grand totals, so I'm going to turn them uh, on for rows and columns. You could also, if you had subtotals, we don't have subtotals in our data here, but you could also control them from here as well. So a few different formatting things that you can do. Now on the analyze ribbon, we have some further options. So if we start over on the left-hand side, pivot table name. Now I'm gonna practice what I preach. I did say that I like to name everything when I'm working in Excel. So I'm gonna give my pivot table a little name. So let's call this, uh, what should we call it? Uh, we'll do branch underscore sales and hit enter. We have underneath there some options. So this is where you can control some of the pivot table options. I will say if you're just starting out with pivot tables, you're probably not going to need to go into here. But if you are a little bit more advanced, this is a good area to look in because it does give you some, some really useful little things to help you control the way your pivot tables are displayed. So it's worth having a look through those options at some point. We have things like uh, slices, which we're going to look at in a moment. Um, we can refresh our pivot table from here. Again, we're going to look at that in a moment. We can change our data source. So if you want to switch it from the table data source to something else, we could do that. And we have some various options for moving and controlling our pivot table. And then we have things like pivot table charts or sorry, pivot charts at the end here. Now, the thing that I want to show you is um, when I'm clicked in my data, so I'm going to click over here in my dates area, I want to show you this group field. And if I click on group field, this is where the default comes in. So when you select a uh, date, this is why it adds dates and months. And it's because in the settings, we have it set to always add dates, days and months. So if you didn't want that, so if you were clicking on date, if you just wanted it to by default display the month, you could certainly deselect days in there. So next time when you drag it down, it's not going to add days and months. Okay, so just remember, you can control what you're displaying through that group field option. Hopefully that makes sense so far. These webinars go so quickly, it's like 15 minutes to go and I've still got so much to tell you about pivot tables. All right, let's move on to our next item. Now, we've been through some of those grand totals uh, and subtotals. So something else that you can do in here, and I am actually going to turn off subtotals, uh, sorry, grand totals for this. So I'm going to turn it off for um, rows and columns. Now, a cool little thing that you can do with pivot tables is that you can add uh, data into your pivot table that doesn't necessarily exist in your original source data. So, for example, maybe I want to see um, the percentage of sales for each month. So what percentage of sales do we have for each month? And I could do that even though I don't have the percentage listed in here. I could do it. And the way I do that is by dragging the value field down to values again. So you can drag the same field and drop it into the same drop zone multiple times. So if I drag value down to values again, you see I get uh, another column in here. Actually, let me do this. because That's a bit of a complicated display. I'm just going to display these in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm just trying to think what's the best way to show you these. Yeah, let's do it like that. So I'm just going to arrange my pivot table slightly different. So we have our months followed by our branch. And let's drag the value down here again. That's better. 
And what I get is a second column just here, which says sum of value. Now, if I want to show the percentage breakdown of sales for each of the branches, what I can do is I can change this. So I can say up here, I want it to be um, percentage sales. And then I can right click on my data and I can say uh, show values as and then I have lots of different options. So it depends how you want it to display. But I want to say display it as a percentage of the grand total. And that gives me a breakdown. So I can see here the percentage of the sales for January for each of the branches, so on and so forth. And I've got my subtotal here for uh, January, February, March, so on and so forth. Now, this is a good example for subtotals. Now, by default, again, and I don't particularly like it this way, subtotals are shown at the top of the column. Now, that doesn't suit me. When I'm looking at a list of data, I, in general, like to see my subtotals at the bottom followed by my grand totals. So this is where you could go back to your design ribbon and change your subtotals to show at the bottom of the group. And there we go. We now have the January subtotals at the bottom. That's a bit more pleasing to my eye. I don't know if you like to display it that way. It's entirely up to you how you display it. All right. So that's how you can add additional data in. And there's a whole host of options in there, which we don't have time to cover today. But again, maybe that might be another webinar we could do of more advanced pivot table functions. Always good to know. Now, one thing I do want to show you is I want to show you how you can update data because this is a really important point. Now, I'm going to go back to my store data over here. And actually, before we do that, let's insert a chart because I think it's easier to see the data update if we have a chart in there. OK, let's talk about charts. Once you have your data in your pivot table organized how you want it organized, and again, I'm just going to switch this around a little bit. Um, let's do, I'm going to remove the percentage of sales. So I'm just going to remove that field. And I'm going to stick with my data like this. So it's fairly straightforward data. So say that's how I want it. And maybe I think, OK, now I want to create a chart based off of this data. So again, very simple to do. Just make sure that you're clicked in your pivot table and then you can go up to your analyze ribbon and you have across at the side a pivot chart button. So let's select pivot chart. And again, what Excel will do is it will look at your data in its current layout and it will suggest to you the best suited chart for your data. So it's telling me that the clustered column chart is the best chart for the data that I have selected. So I'm not going to argue with Excel. I'm going to go with the clustered column and I'm going to click OK. And it gives me a very nice little chart, which I'm just going to make a little bit bigger by dragging the corner out. So I, now I have a nice visual representation of my data. And again, the same with pivot tables, pivot charts, when you click on them, you get a contextual ribbon. So if you cast your eyes to the top of the screen again, we have pivot chart tools and we have three sub ribbons for charts. There's a whole host of formatting and layout options for charts. And let me just close this pane down so it's a bit easier to see and make it a bit bigger. And again, I'm not going to go through all of the options you have on here. I'll leave you to explore those. Um, but we do have a format ribbon. We have a design ribbon uh, and we have an analyze ribbon as well. So I can do lots of things on my chart with this. So let's do some basic formatting. Now, one thing I don't like on my chart is I don't particularly like these little gray buttons. They are useful because it means I can filter my chart specifically. So if I click the, the department drop down, I could change my chart. So if I wanted to see just uh, the information for, uh, let's say, breads, chocolates and coffee, I can do that directly from within my chart and my data will update just to show that information. I can see when I have a filter applied because I get that little filter icon. So if I want to clear that filter, I can just select all again to put that information back. 
So these little drop downs are quite useful, but they are just filters. And I'm going to show you a different way of filtering. So I'm going to get rid of all of these gray little filter buttons on the chart. And you do that by right clicking and you can say hide all field buttons on chart. That will get rid of them all. And to me, I feel that that just makes the chart look a lot cleaner. You don't have to get rid of them, but I just like to do that. You could also add some more chart elements in. So my chart possibly needs a title. And you'll see I have two little buttons on the right hand side of my chart, which will allow me to add different elements. So I'm going to add a chart title and it gives me this is just a text box. And I'm going to say this is a uh, sales by branch. And I could add uh, axes titles. I could remove the legend if I wanted to. I could do lots of different formatting things, but I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Now, the reason why I've removed those filter buttons is because I want to show you a different way of filtering. I want to show you that thing that I love so much, and that is slicers. And if you've never used them before, they're a really lovely visual way of being able to filter data. And sometimes they're a lot more uh, easy for people to use than maybe using filters on the chart. So the only thing with filters, uh, sorry, with slicers is that they do take up quite a bit of room on your spreadsheet. So what I always say to people is if you are going to put some slicers on your spreadsheet is to make sure you leave some room for them, which I haven't done in this case. So I'm going to have to make some room for my slicers. So I'm going to move my chart along and I'm actually going to insert a column just here. And I'm going to make it a bit wider because my slicers are going to go down the side just here. And I think I can move my chart back a bit. There we go. All right. So I'm going to click on my chart. I'm going to go up to analyze and I'm going to select insert slicer. And what this will do is again, it will pick up my column headings and you can choose which one of these you want to slicer for. So I'm going to say, let's have a slicer for branch and department. And I'm going to click OK. And it gives me these two little panels, which I can then drag over to the space that I've left at the side and I can resize these if I want to. And I just like to place them quite nicely down the edge just here. And again, you can format your slicers. So whilst I'm clicked on this slicer, we have a contextual ribbon called slicer tools at the top. And again, you can do things like format them. So if I want to keep everything sort of a consistent color palette, I could choose to make these purple as well. And I can also choose to uh, change the layout. So again, if I've got my branches here, I could say adjust the columns. So in this buttons group just here, I could say I want two columns, which puts my buttons makes them a little bit smaller and puts them in two columns, which gives me a little bit more room. So again, you can kind of do this, uh, whatever suits you, like so. And what these allow you to do is they're just filters. So I could click on Atlanta and it's just going to give me the information for Atlanta. And you'll see both the pivot table and the pivot chart update. If I want to select Atlanta and Detroit, I could hold down control and select Detroit as well. And it puts that information in. Maybe I just want to see the sales for um, two departments for Atlanta and Detroit. So maybe I want to see sales for juices and uh, smoothies. And there we go. OK, so lots of different ways that you can utilize these little slicers. I really, really enjoy them. And uh, <laughs> you can clear the filters from these slicers just by clicking the little funnel at the top to bring everything back again. So you can add those in. And I think they're a nice way of controlling your pivot charts and pivot tables. Now, what you can do, and you can probably see, is you can start to really build this up into what we call a dashboard. And that is a whole other session. And it, we do a session called Interactive Dashboards, where we kind of explore this concept and we build a really, really nice interactive dashboard using 
multiple pivot tables, pivot charts, slices, spark lines, all kinds of things to give you a really nice dashboard which can display your data in a really nice way. So again, that could be another webinar that we do for you in the future if that's something that interests you. Um, so mine isn't particularly nicely displayed at the moment. I'm sure you can make yours uh, look a lot prettier than I have by adding some headings in and positioning these objects a little bit nicer. Now, the last thing I want to show you is just how you update your data. So if we jump back to store data down here, as we know, data doesn't always remain static. So I'm going to jump down to the bottom of my data by doing control down arrow to take me to my last row. Now, it might be that next month I add in some more data. This is highly likely you have to add in more sales data. So I'm going to add another um, row at the bottom. And actually, if I add one more row, you probably won't be able to see the difference. Let me do it a slightly different way. So really what I want to show you is how when you make changes to this table, how it updates in your pivot table, in your pivot chart. So let me do something that's going to be a more dramatic change. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click in my data. And I'm going to go to my design ribbon and I'm going to say resize table. And what I'm actually going to do is here you can see my cell ranges. So it's telling me that my table is cell A1 to D 34,110. I'm going to just display or just use the first 15,000 rows in my data. So I'm cutting down the amount of data I'm using. OK, and click OK. So now I just have the first 15,000 rows in my data. So if I go back to my pivot table, I need to update my pivot table with that change that I've made. Because currently my pivot table and my pivot chart is still showing the data for all 34,000 rows. And this is what I love. And this is why it's important to put your data in a table. If it's in a table, all you need to do to update your pivot table is go to the Analyze ribbon and click the refresh button. And you'll see there, it's completely cut down all of the data and it's removed anything that's no longer relevant and the chart has also updated. All right, so very, very quick. If we didn't have our data in the table, we wouldn't be able to do that. And that is the big advantage of using a table for your data. If you make any changes to that data, either adding data or removing data, to get it to update in your pivot table, you then just need to click the refresh button. So really, really nice and easy to do. All right, guys, that was a very, very quick run through of pivot tables. Hopefully that's made it a little bit easier to understand. It is a lot of information to take in in one uh, go, but um, I will open it up to questions now. If anybody has any questions, please feed them through. I can't see the chat panel, so if Adam can have a little look through any questions that we've got and feed them through, and I will endeavor to answer. Yeah, hi Debs, fantastic um, webinar. Um, we've had a couple of questions, but I think most of them have been answered as we've been going along. Just oh. what version of Excel you're using, which is the yes. the latest version, right? In thinking three six five twenty nineteen. Yes, exactly. So I'm using 2019, but for those of you that are using 2016 and 2013, 2019 is basically the same. So <laughs> don't worry that you're going to miss out on anything. It is pretty much the same. <laughs> Fantastic. We did have one question earlier about um, if column D had uh, little b and then capital R-E-A-D pudding. Um, yes. Proper doesn't work. So what to do in that um, situation? Uh, so if it had, let's see, little b and then R-E-A-D. Um, I would have thought that would work. Let's. I'm always happy to be proved wrong. Let's, let's see. Test it out for us. <laughs> Test it out. It does work. Yeah, I thought it did. It, it should all it does capitalize. Work. Yeah, it does work. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. I'm, I'm just going to take the um, screen back because it doesn't Go look like it. we have loads of um, loads of questions coming Stunned through. Silent. 
<laughs> no, loads of loads of compliments actually. Um, and lots of people wanting to see more of those kind of webinars. So, if you oh, are perfect. interested in seeing more webinars, um, you know this is this is something we've been talking about doing for a while, and um, we're really glad we've um, we've done this one. Um, if you want to see more of them, then let us know. We've already had a few comments in the box already to say, I think I saw VLOOKUP, I saw some other stuff. Debs is actually an expert in Microsoft Office, so presentations, all sorts of stuff. The dashboards uh, webinar seems to be a real hit, Deb. so I think we're going to have to yes. do that one soon. And cool. I love all a right. VLOOKUP, so um, I do we love a VLOOKUP. <laughs> we love our VLOOKUPs. Um, great. Loads of, um, loads of compliments as well on everything. Um, oh, thanks, so, guys. Yeah, that's great. So um, for online courses in Excel, Office, QuickBooks, Project Photoshop, and so much more. Do take a look at simonsaysit.com and streamskill.com. Hello, we've got a load of our members on here uh, tonight. You can join um, monthly or annually, get access to all courses. And this is the type of thing that we cover. So this is the type of um, content that we are now starting to uh, um, update for Excel 2019. Um, and yeah, Pivot Tables is definitely in there. Um, and uh, and yes, yeah, so it will um, dashboards and other things. So I can't see any more questions. A couple of people asking for VLOOKUPs. Lots of people mm -hmm. saying very informative. You know what? We're on the hour exactly. That's unbelievable. Okay. I don't think we've ever done one in exactly. <laughs> we haven't. I, I normally run over because I talk a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, you're doing really well. You've really cut down on your. Uh, <laughs> Thank on your you. I've been working on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's top work. It's top work. Okay, a few people that had issues with the audio, but there will be a video available if you registered via email. We'll be sending it around on the uh, on, on email. That will happen automatically. We're also going to get this uploaded to the Simon Says It YouTube channel. So please subscribe to the channel, um, and you'll see it there. And we'll make sure that we put a link to the Excel file as well, so you can you can practice. Um, someone actually asking specifically for a Slices webinar. Dana, that's exactly what we'll cover if we do a dashboards webinar. Um, slices, yes. timelines, that's a bit of homework for everyone actually. If you yep. like if you like Slices um, and you're playing around with Excel and uh, a pivot table in Excel, and you've got dates, try adding a timeline. It does the yes. same thing, but for dates, it's really, really cool. One of my favorite bits of functionality. You could um, do a whole webinar on filtering. There is a lot to filtering. You could, you could incorporate slices and timelines and the different ways that you can filter. So that might be a good webinar to do as well, filtering and sorting. Cool, great. So yeah, people asking for, for more on that kind of stuff and some, some more advanced stuff as well, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming and uh, staying with us for the hour. It's um, brilliant. We um, we pretty much had uh, everyone in attendance the whole time, which is fantastic to see. Um, but that is that is it from us. We're going to say good night. Have a fantastic uh, evening, morning, afternoon, or day, depending <laughs> on where you are in the world. Uh, it's evening time for me and Deb, so we're off to have our dinner. Okay, yes. bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Cheers, Deb.